I'm just welcoming you all. Thank you. I just noticed a few people are coming in. It's gone six o'clock Melbourne time, Sydney time. So we'll just let we'll just give it a minute or so, waiting for people to uh, just make their way in through the webinar, find their way into the right room. So yeah, well, welcome to all you who are, who are joining. It's an absolute pleasure that you've um, found the time to 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 come and and to listen to this tonight. As I said, if those are just arriving, I'm just going to give it another minute or so, give people time to um, navigate their way in and register. So you'll notice that um, on the web the webinar that we have, the way we've set it up, you won't have access to um, talking with Peter and I, but there is, uh, and you'll notice that the chat function is disabled. So don't panic, we've got a Q&A section there you'll see next to in between chat and polls and so we're very happy for you to um, at the end of Peter's presentation to to put your questions into the Q&A function and we'll have a lot of time at the end for, um, for a bit of discussion based on the questions that you might put in the chat so I'll keep an eye on the on, on the q and I mean I'll keep an eye on the Q&A as we go um, but um, of course, as I said, it's just um, uh, if it's anything urgent, we can um, stop. So, what I'll do is I think I'll do my I'll start I'll I'll make a start. I've got some notes I'm just going to access here on my screen um, to read. So I think we'll yeah we'll get started to just a minute or so, a couple of minutes past six. Uh, so welcome. Everyone, welcome to our third and final community facing webinar that's aimed at the general public hosted by the Sleep Health Foundation. My name is Moira Junger and I'm the proud CEO of the Sleep Health Foundation. So I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country, which is the land of the people of the Kulin Nation here in Inner Melbourne. And we pay our respects to the traditional owners of all the lands on which we're all meeting across the nation this evening and welcome any First Nation uh, Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. Um, we also pay our respects to First Nations understanding of health, which is very holistic, very holistic view. Um, and we at the Sleep Health Nation draw inspiration from it. Aboriginal health does not mean the physical well-being of an individual, but refers to the social, emotional, cultural well-being of the whole community. Um, for Aboriginal people, this is seen in terms of whole life view and includes broad issues like uh, social justice, equity, respect, responsibility, rights, as well as traditional knowledge, traditional healing and connection to country. So in a minute, I'll introduce our very special guest, but just want to say a few words about us at the Sleep Health Foundation. We were formed in 2009 and we have our mission, vision and objectives focused on improving the health, well-being, performance, productivity of all Australians via better health, um, by better sleep. We also aim to provide strong advocacy to help meet the health needs of the whole community, as well as people with sleep disorders. We want to raise awareness, educate and inform about the importance of sleep, how to improve it or know what to do about it if it's inadequate. So we do this via our website, via our speaker program, in workplaces and schools, media, social media, and more recently, these public facing webinars. So now the most important thing next is to introduce you to Professor Peter Sassoon, um, who I've long admired in our field. And I heard him give this presentation in Sydney this year in July. And I thought to myself, this is exactly the kind of thing that the general population need to know about our field. So I've asked Peter uh, he's, um, to present tonight and very, very grateful that he's been able to do this for us. Um, Professor Peter Sestoli is a clinical researcher with 30 years experience in the fields of respiratory and sleep medicine. He's a professor of sleep medicine at the University of Sydney and holds the ResMed chair. He leads the sleep research team within the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary Charles Perkins Centre and holds a prestigious NHMRC leadership fellowship to support his research. He's also a clinical director of the sleep medicine program in the Department of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine. Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. So it's it's even longer, it goes on to all the other um, achievements, which I'll, I'll, I can touch on later. But I think 
I just wanted to add that he was the former president of the Australasian Sleep Association and a former board member of the Sleep Health Foundation. Um, so thanks, Peter. I think I'll over to you. Um, we'll take questions and discussion at, at the end. So I just welcome Peter to give his presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Moira. It's uh, an absolute delight uh, to be giving this talk tonight. And I thank um, the audience for, for turning up uh, on a Tuesday night to, to listen to this. Um, I'd like to start by um, paying my respects to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation upon which uh, the University of Sydney um, is built. Pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so um, let me see if I can share, I can. <clears throat> and I'll go to slideshow. <clears throat> so this talk, um, is really just meant to kind of stimulate interest and, and discussion fairly broadly. Um, and it, it has an element of looking to the future, but of course, to look to the future, you need to be able to look to the past. Um, and um, I thought it would be useful to just um, start off by giving you a little bit of a context about where I work. Um, First of all, um, the name Charles Perkins should be familiar to you. Um, Charles Perkins was um, the first Indigenous alumnus of any university in Australia, and uh, our centre is named after him largely because um, he was an activist who challenged dogma. Um, and we share that same philosophy in the way we approach some of society's major health issues which are listed on this slide, uh, cancer, dementia, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And the way we do things is a little bit differently to traditional research institutes um, because we recognize that uh, biology alone uh, does not um, provide the full explanation of these disorders and cannot lead to the ultimate solutions that are needed for real world implementation. And so we take a far more holistic perspective. And um, I've just put up a spaghetti map here. You're not intended to, to read it and digest it, but um, it's really to highlight that these health problems um, have myriad causes and factors that contribute together to create the problems. And part of it is individual physiology and psychology, but large parts of it are outside of the individual's um, control and they include in the case of obesity food production food consumption supply chains social psychology but also the built environment and so one of the unique things about our center is that we have scientists and clinicians working alongside each other as per other research institutes but we also bring in um, engineers and architects and artists and um, politicians and lawyers um, just to name a few, to really enrich uh, the perspective of particular problems. Um, and I have the good fortune to lead the sleep theme within um, that Charles Perkins Center. So um, the fact that you've joined this um, webinar tonight tells me that you have a personal interest in sleep. Um, and of course, it's an experience that we all share. And it's captured the imagination of artists and writers um, over the centuries as depicted in some of these artworks and, and this quotation from Shakespeare. So it's really been of quite a major interest um, at a societal level. Um, we've also understood that sleep is ubiquitous across the animal kingdom. Um, every species on earth um, has some form of sleep. And one of the major questions about sleep is, well, why do we sleep? And this quote from one of the pioneers from the sleep field, Alan Refstarkin, um, is if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it is the biggest mistake evolution ever made. In other words, the fact that sleep has survived um, evolution tells us that it has a major survival effect, um, survival benefit. Um, and in reality, I think um, sleep serves many functions and I'll be touching on some of those tonight. Um, much of what we know about the functions of sleep stems from research that um, has looked at the effect of um, inadequate sleep, whether that be 
uh, due to sleep deprivation or um, poor quality sleep, um, all the way through to a range of sleep disorders that can impact um, the duration and quality of sleep. And one of the things that's fascinating about sleep is that it literally affects every part of the human body um, from the brain to the heart, to muscles and joints, to the metabolic system, to the hunger um, and, and, and digestive function, and also uh, immune function, which is really highly relevant in the context of the pandemic, um, because we've understood that sleep affects our immunity and can um, impact our predisposition to um, infections and also to our responses to vaccinations. And so this is really one of the attractions for me as a researcher and as a clinician to be dealing with a problem that has such diverse impacts on the human body. One of the really interesting observations is that too little sleep and too much sleep seem to have detrimental effects. And so we talk about a U-shaped relationship between um, sleep duration um, and some of these um, outcomes. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that there's some kind of a sweet spot um, somewhere around that seven to eight hour mark, which provides optimal functioning, optimal organ function. Um, and if we get too little or too much, um, things go array. Um, there's growing recognition, um, at least in the lay press, about the importance of sleep as depicted in uh, this Time magazine article on the power of sleep. Um, and um, this is around the time of a, an interesting discovery in the sleep field relating to a particular function uh, whereby during um, slow wave sleep, which is a particular stage of sleep, it seems that the brain um, has a washing function where fluid um, shifts through the brain to collect uh, the proteins that build up during the course of a day. Um, you may have heard of proteins such as amyloid uh, and tau that are implicated in dementia. And so this major discovery provides a mechanism by which poor sleep can lead to um, a buildup of these proteins to affect brain function in the long term, um, highlighting just one um, important function of sleep. Um, we know from personal experience, but also from research that uh, there are major individual and societal impacts of inadequate sleep. And in the workplace context, um, there are many mission critical occupations where um, errors can lead to fatal outcomes. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, heavy vehicle drivers, the military, um, our health um, and, and um, other sort of occupations are particularly come to mind in this setting. Uh, but it's also important to remember that um, inadequate sleep affects our decision-making uh, powers, and this can be really uh, important uh, in um, politics, for example, and in our judicial system, um, not to mention um, sort of the workplace more broadly. And of course, um, thinking about the next generation, we need to look at our children, and there's very clear evidence that shows that inadequate sleep in childhood can affect um, learning um, outcomes, um, can affect mood and, and increase the risk of mental health um, issues and the risk of suicide as well. So really quite dramatic um, individual and societal impacts of inadequate sleep. Australia has really led the way in trying to quantify the impact of inadequate sleep in financial terms. And the Sleep Health Foundation, in collaboration with Deloitte Access Economics, uh, conducted a really important piece of work in which they tried to put a number on the cost of inadequate sleep in Australia. And there's a very robust methodology that is applied to this kind of analysis. And they came up with a staggering $66 billion of costs in the financial year 2016-17 attributed to um, inadequate sleep. 
and that equates to almost $10,000 per person in Australia, uh, which I'm sure you'll agree is, is really a staggering number. It's important to recognise that about two-thirds of those costs are related to loss of well-being and productivity. So um, the concern with inadequate sleep is that it's on the rise and the, the prevalence of uh, poor sleep behaviours and the prevalence of sleep disorders is increasing at alarming rates. Um, the, the beginnings of this possibly stem back to the invention of the light bulb um, and the ensuing um, industrial revolution, um, which um, allowed work to um, occur 24 seven and led to the advent of shift work. And a large proportion of our population do engage in shift work. And there's a growing body of research that shows that shift work is associated with um, poor health outcomes. But there are many other factors um, as depicted on this slide and stress um, is a big factor that interferes with our sleep duration and sleep quality. And clearly the last few years of the pandemic have really um, added to that particular issue of stress. Um, it's important to recognise that as a lifestyle behaviour, sleep doesn't occur in isolation. It occurs in tandem with other important lifestyle behaviours such as diet and, and physical activity. And so you can get a double or a triple whammy if you happen to be a poor sleeper who eats poorly and doesn't move much during the day. And we're really at the infancy of trying to understand how these three behaviours interact with each other. Um, and it's a topic of great interest to me um, and, and our, my colleagues at the Charles Perkins Centre trying to bring these lifestyles together to sort of come up with very useful practical um, recommendations that people can apply in their daily lives. Um, technology um, is our friend, um, but also our foe. Um, it improves productivity, but I think we'll all know from personal experience that technology can uh, be a major distractor for sleep. Um, and we also know that um, it adds to the light pollution that um, confuses our brains at night. And, and uh, instead of recognizing uh, the night cues as being important for sleep and allowing our brain to release melatonin um, that really sets the stage for sleep to occur, uh, bright lights at that time of the day um, have a detrimental effect on the release of melatonin and our ability to sleep well. Um, alcohol is a bit of an elephant in the room as well. It interferes with the sleep process. Um, it can promote snoring, it can promote sleep fragmentation. Um, and so it's another important factor. And then along with stress, um, things can evolve into clinical mood disorders, whether it be anxiety or depression, all of which can interact with these other factors to interfere with sleep. So inadequate sleep is on the rise and um, we need to be aware of that and really plan um, ahead in terms of managing um, people's health at a community level, but also developing the clinical capacity to manage the avalanche of sleep disorders that um, interact with many other chronic diseases. Um, just a little digression around um, ultra long haul flights. Um, now that COVID uh, seems to have been tamed, um, travels back on people's agendas. And for many people, um, this is part of their occupation, either because they work in the airline industry or they travel a lot and uh, there's a, a large interest now in understanding the health effects of ultra long haul flights. And at the Charles Perkins Center, we have a partnership with Qantas um, around some of their ultra long haul flights, initially with the Perth London flight, but now planning some 22 hour flights between Sydney and New York and Melbourne, New York, and, and also straight to London. So. This is gonna challenge um, our human physiology and our circadian uh, clocks. And uh, we need to kind of understand how to mitigate some of uh, these uh, risks. 
So um, all of this is uh, to say that it's definitely time to pay attention to sleep. And, and in many ways, sleep is the new health frontier um, as highlighted in this um, Time magazine article um, about um, eight years ago. Um, and it really recognises that sleep is just as important as, as diet and exercise, which have really received a lot of airplay in public health messaging for decades. And so sleep is the new kid on the block and uh, we need to work hard to ensure that it achieves equal footing alongside these other um, well-known lifestyle uh, factors. And um, it's pleasing to see that the Australian government um, is starting to recognise the importance of sleep. Um, a few years ago now, um, a parliamentary inquiry was established into sleep health awareness in Australia. Um, and many people um, uh, across uh, sectors within uh, the sleep field and beyond made uh, a range of submissions that led to um, this report. Um, and amongst the numerous recommendations that were made in that report, the first um, really says it all that um, the committee recommends that the Australian government prioritise sleep health as a national priority and recognise its importance to health and wellbeing alongside fitness and nutrition. Now, unfortunately, the, the pandemic has probably um, slowed down um, things since that report came out, um, but it's pleasing uh, to see that things are, are now back on the move and, and there's an important initiative that's being um, activated in partnership with the Sleep Health Foundation uh, through the Australian Health Policy um, Collaboration to really try and, and develop some policy around um, the importance of sleep health or healthy sleep. Um, and just to show you that professional societies are starting to recognise the importance of sleep. Um, very recently, the American Heart Association uh, released its latest um, Life's Essentials, um, in this case, Life's Essential 8, and sleep features prominently amongst um, eight, a checklist of eight factors that are important for lifelong good health. So it's very gratifying to see that, uh, that uh, these, uh, the importance of sleep is starting to be picked up um, at that level. And of course, um, a big plug to the Sleep Health Foundation for the tremendous work they're doing in public health advocacy. Um, really, it's a young organisation and in a relatively short space of time, um, they're really starting to achieve some impact. So um, what about the, the future of um, sleep and sleep health? Um, so um, I think that um, we need to view this um, through the lens of what's happening to the future of healthcare more broadly. And I think um, what we could say there is that um, we have an epidemic of chronic diseases um, which are impacting our health span. Um, health span is um, the amount of one's lifespan that is free of disease. Um, and in the ideal world, our health span would be not too much short of our lifespan. In other words, we lead a very healthy life and then uh, fall off the perch, so to speak. Instead, um, what's happening is that people are developing chronic diseases at relatively younger ages um, and living with these chronic diseases for many years before they die. And this is putting a huge burden on our health system, which is really stretched. And this way of approaching problems, in other words, letting diseases develop before we spend a lot of money trying to fix them, is simply no longer sustainable. And so we need to go upstream and deal with the root causes of these chronic diseases. And in many ways, these root causes are embedded within the lifestyle behaviours of sleep, nutrition and physical activity. And we really need to start focusing on developing preventive health strategies to try and um, increase um, people's health span. Um, and so this is a fundamental shift that needs to help it happen in the health system and improving people's sleep is very much part of that. 
Another interesting and exciting um, thing that's evolving in the health system um, is, is comes under the term of P4 medicine, which is a, a term that's been coined to describe the convergence of um, traditional clinical medicine with a more systems approach. Um, in other words, dealing with the whole rather than individual organ-based problems, um, combining that with um, the digital revolution and very sophisticated ways of analyzing large data sets combined with social networks. And the, the term P4 um, relates to the fact that this kind of health system is intended to be one that is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. Um, and so that's a very ambitious um, uh, uh, perspective on the future of um, our health system. Um, the CSIRO, CSIRO um, have um, put forward uh, this view of the, the future of healthcare, where instead of treating patient illness, will be going upstream and managing consumer health and well-being using digital technologies. And we'll be moving from the kind of one size fits all approach to healthcare to one that's more precise and personalized to individuals. Um, moving away from that reactive system that I described to a more holistic and predictive uh, system and moving from just extending life to, as I said, improving lifespan and improving people's quality of life over the lifetime. And so this systems approach to medicine is really um, taking a more holistic perspective and recognizing that um, all aspects of our body interact with each other and that the current approach of sort of an organ-based or disease-based approach to medicine really uh, has its um, shortcomings um, and, and needs to um, be improved. The other important aspect is recognizing the importance of our body clock. Um, it's important to realize that um, every cell in our body is governed by cells. Um, and similarly, our tissues and organs all operate on clocks. Um, these clocks um, can be synchronized. Um, we have a master clock in the brain. And um, in many ways, it functions like the conductor of an orchestra. And when the conductor does their job, um, beautiful music uh, ensues. But without that conductor, we start to see um, cellular, molecular and organ functions all working out of sync to um, produce um, symptoms um, and risk of disease. And so we're seeing the emergence of circadian medicine, which is intricately linked to sleep medicine, because in many ways, sleep is the archetypal um, manifestation of the circadian clock. Um, and it's the reason that we sleep um, in darkness, or at least we're intended to. Um, so we're starting to see some major gains in our understanding of the circadian system and starting to develop ways of incorporating it into health programs. Um, you've heard me mention the digital revolution and um, it's fair to say that the sleep field is, has been an early adopter in um, the sleep tech revolution. Um, there are many um, gadgets, uh, both of the clinical variety um, and also the consumer variety that um, measure aspects of sleep. And we're starting to see that consumers have a fascination with um, their sleep and, and measuring it in any way they can. Um, and so, so in many ways, the sleep field is ahead of the game in sort of bringing together um, these technologies in a way that makes sense, um, both at a consumer level, at a population level, but also at the clinical level and individual patient level. Um, and just on the issue of digital connectivity, um, 
you know, over 80% of Australians have a smartphone and a high proportion use wearable devices to measure some aspect of their physiology. And 84% uh, of Australians will um, go online to um, obtain some health information uh, before seeking um, clinical input. So it's really a, a strong measure of um, patient and consumer engagement um, with uh, digital technologies. We need to embrace that and help our consumers, our community, our patients to appreciate the benefits and pitfalls of um, these technologies. So predicting the future is pretty hard, um, so it's better to create it yourself. And um, with this kind of idea in mind, um, the Australian um, sleep research community has recently come together. Um, we've been able to put together a rather impressive consortium of um, uh, hospital partners from the public system across um, Australia, together with some government partners and industry partners, uh, including the likes of uh, tech giants such as Microsoft and Fitbit Google, um, together with more industry specific partners. Um, and importantly, with um, consumer groups such as the Sleep Health Foundation, the Australasian Sleep Association um, and Sleep Disorders Australia. Um, together with academic partners. And the idea here is that, that we would harmonize our data collection from our clinical uh, sleep laboratories, um, which are some of the best in the world, um, and combine that data with um, wearables data and other forms of data that can uh, be linked in, um, including electronic health records and other administrative data sets, as well as geolocalization data, um, as you can see on the left side of that um, slide. And the idea is that this pooled data um, would enter into a digital platform that would um, then uh, de-identify it and put it into a central repository where the data can be subjected to um, sophisticated analytical approaches such as machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches, which can then um, be interrogated at the um, individual person level to derive some kind of recommendation or prescription. And so this is a very powerful approach to use of data uh, to um, uh, bring it back down um, into the clinic um, and down to um, the individual consumer. So um, this is an ambitious project. It's not yet funded um, and we're waiting the outcome of a federal government funding grant, uh, which will hopefully kickstart this kind of national approach to um, sleep health. So um, I'm going to finish um, on that note um, and uh, very much look forward to continuing the discussion uh, with Moira and uh, anyone uh, who has um, some questions. Thank you. <laughs> on behalf of, of the group. So yeah, that was wonderful. Um, second time around, I um, just got a lot out of it again. So thanks. Thanks so much for your insights. I was just um, call upon the audience to use the Q&A function. If you'd like to um, put your hand up, um, we'll put a, a question into the Q&A. Um, I do believe that you're actually able to uh, speak if you want to speak as well. I think I, I can actually find your name um, if you can alert me to that and able to um, allow talking in, into this discussion. But while you're all getting your gathering your thoughts and thinking of questions, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to just talk a little bit more around, um, ask a few questions myself, um, Peter. Thinking about particularly this, uh, the role of physicians, like with this, the new, the future of sleep and the 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 tech, the revolution of tech. Do you feel like that it's uh, there'll always be physicians involved, or less so, or not at all? Do you have a prediction of the actual human interface with um, health professionals in the sleep 
sort of the sleep lab, if you like, that sort of typical setting. Yeah, thank you, Moira. Um, the, the challenge that we have um, is that sleep, um, inadequate sleep is very, very common in our community. Sleep disorders are very common um, in our community. Um, and just to give you an example, you know, the sleep apnea, which is a disorder that I research and, and uh, practice clinically, um, there are almost 1 billion people in the world. Insomnia is more common than that and, and poor sleep behaviours are even more common than that. So, um, so it's impractical to think that our health system could ever cope with that. Um, and it's certainly beyond... Um, the capacity of sleep physicians of which you know i don't know at last count there might be three or four hundred in australia uh, there's no way that we could cope with the avalanche of sleep disorders so so i think we have to bolster capacity at all levels um, within the health system i think primary care is an obvious place to improve awareness of sleep health issues so that um patients can go to their GP and, and that can be their first port of call for assessing uh, sleep complaints. But even that, um, there's not going to be enough capacity. And I think that there needs to be a massive public health um, campaign um, to really empower individuals um, at a community level to take responsibility for their own uh, health and well-being. Um, around all lifestyle behaviours, um, but in this context about sleep in particular. And so that's going to require a massive um, education aspect uh, to the program, the development of tools. Um, and I think this is where the digital revolution will become particularly handy um, through partnerships with technology providers um, you know, we'll be using wearables um, in the community um, and developing some kind of a system to capture the people who are identified as being at risk, um, some kind of metric that will assess an individual as having poor sleep behaviours and developing a system to alert them to that and, and then being able to try to deal with that at a community level um, but then having a system where, or a safety net where people can then come into the clinical system. Yeah. yeah. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but but it is a complex yeah. challenge given yeah. how huge the problem is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a lot of questions. I'll get. I'll, I'll start reading through the questions in the Q and A. Not sure if you can probably see them as well. Let's start. Dorothy has a, a, a something very interesting. Thanks, Dot. Um, what are one or two big questions you would like the Sleep Biobank to address? Um, yeah, no, I think, um, you know, these are, this Biobank is going to be collecting data from um, clinical sleep services. So these are patients who have obviously been through the health system, the GP referred to a sleep clinic, have a sleep study. Um, but what we don't know a lot about um, in this context is people's kind of lifestyle choices, lifestyle behaviours and the interactions that these have with their sleep disorder. And, and we're hoping that by gathering this data, um, we will sort of have a better understanding of how lifestyle factors, nutrition, physical activity um, and other factors contribute to the burden of their sleep disorder and then be able to develop and implement um, uh, uh, interventions to try and manage this. And these would be largely behavioural interventions that I'm talking about rather than pharmacological interventions. So that's, that's an example of the kind of thing that we would like to look at. Yep. Great. I'll keep moving. There's lots of questions, so I'll keep moving down. Keep, keep adding questions, everyone. As we've got about 20 minutes or, you know, 10, 20 minutes left or so. So I'm happy to just keep asking them. Caroline, Dr. Caroline Hong had a question. What percentage of population in Australia have sleep disorders? Has it increased significant, significantly in the last few years because of people seeking help and aware of symptoms due to education? A good question. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess um, if you think about, for example, insomnia, 30% of Australians will experience insomnia at some point in their life, but about 10% um, experience persistent or chronic insomnia. So, so that's just one disorder. Sleep apnea, I've already explained, is very common. So, you know, we're talking about you know, sleep disorders potentially being the most common non-communicable diseases. Um, and, and they often um, have significant impact on other chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, um, and even mental health disorders. So, so the burden of sleep disorders um, and their broader impact on chronic diseases is really huge. And, and I think, yeah, you're right that um, a growing awareness and education around symptoms is starting to bring more people into the clinical realm. Um, and we need to really prepare, uh, as I said, build capacity to be able to deal um, with this growing burden. Do you, do you feel like, um, I know that the Sleep Health Foundation's uh, website, we, we quote that we think that about 80% of uh, obstructive sleep apnea is undiagnosed. Would you would you think it would be that high? Is that your feeling? Yeah, it's a figure that that I um, often cite, um, and uh, that sort of the iceberg um, that I had early on in my presentation, yeah, just depicts that idea that that we've really just scratched the tip of the iceberg, and and the majority of people with these problems are out there in the community either not aware that they have a problem or not being able to access um, the care that, that they need uh, for a whole range of reasons. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think the, the overwhelming um, proportion of people with the disorder aren't in our health system yet. Yeah, yeah. okay, another question from um, Anonymous. Do you believe that relaxing the brain, so via meditation, baths, etc., are effective in helping you to get a better night's sleep? He mentioned alcohol, food, and exercise can be effective. Do you believe a calm state of mind is one of these important factors? There's no doubt that um, that sort of relaxation approaches, um, you know, are a way of tackling the stress that is so common in our 24 seven society. And so, so really any form of relaxation, whether it be meditation, mindfulness, um, you know, it, it's gonna have a beneficial effect. Um, so, so I'd be a strong advocate for incorporating that kind of um, behavioral intervention into um, a broader suite of interventions. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I can just add with my psychology hat on to that, that um, a lot of people do sometimes maybe overinvest in this, the calm mind and the calm state and ramp up a bit of arousal accidentally by trying too hard to put effort in to be calm. So sometimes it's a paradoxical approach of just like this, the principles of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia are really kind of shrugging your shoulders a little bit in terms of matching the sleep you have with the amount that you're realistically getting at that time. So if you haven't slept well for, you know, 10 years, don't aim for eight hours, you know, just sort of go with where you're at and then build it back from there. So yeah, a range of approaches, um, obviously, as, as Peter said, uh, the other factors too, like not just the calming the mind. So, but we'll, I couldn't help by adding my little two bits. No, thank there. you for that. <laughs> um, Sharon has asked us, um, how will, how will paediatric sleep um, challenges be addressed in the big data capture with the Australian Sleep Biobank? I'm not surprised by that question from Sharon. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, unfortunately, that the application that we put together um, was a major challenge. And, and so all the sleep services that we've listed there are adult services. Um, but our um, hope is that... Um, the program would um, be expanded um, over time um, to bring in more services, um, including uh, paediatric services. And of course, you know, when you talk about prevention, the earlier you start in life, um, the better it is. And so really um, the solution to our health system is really to tackle 
pediatric, um, you know, health challenges and, and poor lifestyle behaviours and the like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a huge, I agree, like the pediatric sleep and adolescent sleep, it it's, should be a real priority area for, for, for the society for tackling this. Um, we'll keep moving through the questions. There's a couple from Deborah Schubert. What are your recommendations on napping? Is not napping better than napping? Um, and then there's another question. Maybe I'll take that one, yeah. Take that one first. Yeah, so often um, there's no, no black and white here or one size fits all. Um, I think, you know, napping can be good and it can be bad. And, you know, as you may know, in, in some societies, um, there's the traditional siesta, which kind of um, matches the sort of circadian dip that um, that we naturally have um, sort of early afternoon. Um, and, and, and so if you're a good sleeper at night and you happen to have a, a nap during the day, um, I don't see that as being detrimental and I'm not aware of evidence that suggests that. Um, however, if you're not a good sleeper, and in particular, if you've got insomnia, um, where you have difficulty getting off to sleep or staying asleep at night, then certainly um, napping during the day can uh, perpetuate that problem. Um, one of the aspects of staying awake is that there's a buildup of, let's call them chemicals in our brains that make us sleepy. And if you haven't had an adequate buildup of these chemicals, uh, which are part of what we call the homeostatic drive, um, then, then you won't sleep well at night and having a nap can sort of impact um, those chemicals. So it could be good and it could be bad. And, and I think we can just add the, um, what the, the idea of a shorter nap. The power that, nap. Yeah, the people don't wake up, they're less likely to wake up out of deep sleep, less likely to have grogginess. Yes. yes and less likely to affect the, the sleep period that night. So napping, napping's an interesting one. That, um, on the media, the media ask about napping, I reckon, on a weekly basis and trying to have sort of simple, quick little answers to complex things. So it's a, yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky one. Um, Cause napping depends if you're a shift worker, of course, too. Like if you were, you know, needing to nap preemptively, it can be recommended during the day. So it's a bit of a, yeah, but that's a great answer. Thanks, um, Peter. So um, yeah, Deborah, I'm not, I think, Peter, are you aware of the military method of sleep? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, no, I've read the question. Um, yep. I, I don't know if everyone can see it, but it's around, um, yeah, the military method of getting short bouts of sleep um, under stressful conditions. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm certainly no expert on the military context, but, you know, we can all appreciate that uh, um, there's a, you know, a very hard to get a normal sleep-wake pattern um, in that um, context. And so... Coming back to Moira's idea of the power nap, I think um, that has merit. Um, I'm not sure that a two minute kind of sleep um, would uh, suffice um, in that context. Um, I do know that the military sort of often um, will resort to um, um, wakefulness promoting drugs to, to help um, their personnel um, stay awake. These are stimulant medications um, that are meant to counteract um, the sleepiness that um, occurs with sleep deprivation. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a very challenging um, context um, and, and it's one where um, there's a lot of obviously stress um, from military action itself, um, but also the sleep deprivation, um, you know, has been anecdotally associated with errors of judgment that I talked about before, um, hallucinations and, and things like that. So, so it's a very, very challenging um, area. Sure is. Uh, another anonymous question about, I, I guess, asking if your particular research institute, I know some are, looking into the benefits of CBD oil and sleep. Um, so um, at the University of Sydney, um, there's a what's called the Lambert Initiative, which is dedicated to understanding um, the benefits of cannabinoids uh, for health. 
um, and I'm part of a collaborative um, grant application um, which um, is intended to look at the interaction between um, pain, uh, chronic pain, um, and, and, and the mediating role of sleep and the potential benefit of um, CBD um, in that context. Um, so it is an area of interest. There is some early research that has come out on um, uh, various forms of um, cannabinoids um, in insomnia, um, showing some benefit, um, it's not huge. Um, and uh, anecdotally in my own clinic, I'm seeing that some patients with insomnia who can afford it are starting to um, use it and, and do describe some benefits. Um, Moira might have more of a, an experience yeah. of that. Uh, again, anecdotally, um, in a clinical setting of clients that have just accessed it themselves, yeah. uh, there's a number of GPs in Melbourne that um, do prescribe it, or, but I think you can actually just buy it on the internet or somehow or other yeah. anyway. It, it's it's very accessible. Uh, with mixed benefits, is, yeah, I haven't seen, I haven't been convinced yet, but I do want to be convinced. So I think it's because so, a lot of people are you know, desperate for solutions, uh, but it have, hasn't yet been the panacea that I, I would have, you know, was hoping to see, uh, but I know other other research groups too, like the, the Sydney group. And have a look. Anyone who's interested, have a look at um, UWA. Uh, I know Jen Walsh and Co. If you look up Jennifer Walsh, I don't know the other authors, but um, they're also yeah. Looking. Peter Eastwood. Um, Peter Eastwood. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Peter Eastwood. Yeah. They've got emerging a couple. You know, some some sort of promising emerging evidence as well. Um, so okay, we've got another question from Caroline. Probably about a final question for the night, perhaps because. Um, but another question um, around pharmacological solutions, what would you be recommending as well as putting on your physician, sleep physician hat, short-term, long-term, if behavioral treatment's not working? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I think sedative medications, hypnotics have kind of um, been used um, to treat uh, sleep disorders, but insomnia in particular for, you know, absolute decades. And, and there's a bit of a stigma, of course, around particularly the use of the benzodiazepines um, because of their addictive potential. Um, the issues with um, the pharmacological agents is that there's not only the risk of um, physical addiction, but there's also psychological dependence. Um, and, and it really undermines some of the behavioral approaches that we're trying to implement, which really form the bedrock of, of long-term solution for insomnia. Uh, without that sort of behavioral approach, um, you simply don't get um, good outcomes with long-term pharmacological therapies. Um, I think some of the old um, medications like uh, temazepam, um, are still amongst my favorites. I think the side effect profile is quite appealing, but there has been sort of multiple developments with the, the Z drugs, um, Zolpidem and uh, Zopoclone, for example. Um, some of those have received uh, bad um, press um, due to some celebrated or celebrities uh, sort of misusing, misusing them, often together with alcohol and doing some strange things um, that that's unfortunate because I, I don't think those medications um, deserve that kind of wrap. Um, but they do do sort of cause um, significant side effects um, in a large proportion of patients. And then I guess the, the most recent developments um, are around um, drugs that uh, revolve around the discovery of erexins in the brain. Um, Erexins are alertness um, promoting um, um, uh, neurochemicals in the brain. And when they're depleted, as in a, cases of narcolepsy, for example, um, you get sleepiness. And people, uh, well, the pharmaceutical industry's kind of cotton on to that to develop ways of um, developing um, um, agonists um, to try and promote. Uh, wakefulness, but also antagonists to promote sleep. Um, and so they're the latest uh, 
types of drugs that are on the market. Um, they're not PBS listed, they're expensive. And um, uh, I think the clinical experience is still in its early days. I personally don't have a lot of experience with those drugs. And just briefly, Caroline just added on a please, please, please ask this extra one. They see that at the bottom, but I put some more nutrients in supplements, which include melatonin, GABA, NAC, and vitamin. Would you, do you have experience with that question? Um, I don't. Uh, so I, I certainly don't have the expertise, but I am aware that, that there is this kind of, um, uh, it's a new research area um, where, um, uh, you know, the, looking at sort of nutraceuticals, let's call them, um, and vitamins uh, to try and improve um, sleep. So, I, it, you know, there's a logic to them. And I think that what my plea would be is that, you know, they're subjected to the kinds of clinical research that, you know, um, to which, you know, standard drug development um, uh, is used. So, so one of the problems with these drugs is, um, or supplements is that they're not sort of under the same regulations as, as standard pharmaceuticals. And so they don't tend to be researched with the same rigor. Um, but I think, yeah, we have to keep an open mind um, with these supplements. Great. Well, really appreciate the um, fantastic in-depth um, answering of the questions as well, giving you a time generous your expertise and your time generously thanks professor Sasuli. absolute and, pleasure um just wanted to let the audience know to have a look on our screen the, the screen at the moment that i'd really you really encourage you to follow us on all the socials the various facebook instagram linkedin and twitter and if you are very clever and hover your phone over the qr code you can go straight to our website and can sign up directly to our newsletter and keep in touch with all the stuff that we're doing and future webinars we're hoping to have them next month next year every month as well with various experts experts on different topics so we'll call it to a, say we'll call it to an end um, and close the the webinar tonight and thank you very very much for for attending and, and particularly to peter for your time Again, a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. Bye.